Welcome to the Flip Your Script podcast. I'm Christy Peel. If you enjoy a glass of wine, grab a French varietal for today's podcast. In the stage of life called middle-aged, Steve Hoffman, a tax preparer, moved his family from Minnesota to the which is in the U.S. for our friends who are global listeners, uh, to a small town in France. His Flip Your Script story led to a James Beard Writing Award and published articles in Food and Wine, The Washington Post, The Minneapolis Star Tribune, and Artful Living Magazine. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Christy. It's great to be here. You know, Steve, I'm doing something I've never done for a podcast special for you. I look at what, what I have. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. Otherwise, you might have to stop. I was I'm hoping. Gonna... I was hoping you had wine. That is mm -hmm. so great. Yep. <laughs> I have wine. And I. this is a Sancerre. Yes, from Beautiful. France. And I'm going to pour it. And I'm going to sip. Because it feels like the only appropriate way. If only I had known, I could have joined you and we could have toasted each other. But I'm, I'll toast you mentally anyway. Thank you You have very water much. probably. So we'll <laughs> I do have plenty of water, yes. And there are other people here at the office who are going to be thrilled that there's now a mostly full <laughs> bottle of wine ready for them to drink. So uh, wine. France is known for wine, but you're a tax preparer in the Midwest who leaves everything and goes off chasing I don't even know it was a dream. Like, talk about what made you just decide to move. Yeah, um, any number of things. Uh, for one, I married well <laughs> and had a had a, a spouse who was up for adventure as well. Um, but really, it goes back to tax repair implies a certain type of person um, that I was not always. Uh, I was in college, a French, ancient Greek, English major, uh, fascinated with writing, with books, with language. And um, that did all kinds of things for me, except give me employable skills. So I, I uh, had to spend a lot of the rest of my early and middle adulthood um, finding ways to make money that, that uh, you know, at least fit with whatever skills that I had. And so there was some real estate there. I, I became a handyman for a while. Um, and then eventually inherited a, a tax preparation business for my mother-in-law. And I, I like to say there's, there is at least a partial connection between languages and being a tax preparer, as crazy as that sounds, because my love of language started with a love of grammar, which is really memorizing rules and applying them. Um, they're, it's very systematized, very linear. And um, in many ways, tax preparation obviously is the same thing. You, you, you learn the rules of the, of the federal tax code, you apply them in various situations to create a proper tax return. So there's a little bit of a connection, but it was certainly a departure from my early life. And, um, but France had always been there in the background. I, sp I, I spent a year in Paris when I was in my early 20s, spoke close to fluent French, certainly conversational French for all of my adulthood. Our two kids went to French immersion school in part in St. Paul, in part because I spoke French and we were hoping that someday, someday we might get back over there. Um, so it, it makes a little bit more sense in that context that we would pull up stakes and go for six months in a tiny, dusty French village that nobody's ever heard of and kind of take our chances. Um, so, but it, it was really... I think the, the the turning point to, to actually make the decision to go was at some point, you know, we had commuted kids from Shoreview, Minnesota to the uh, uh, to the uh, east side of St. Paul for a bunch of years, 45 minutes a day doing flashcards in the back seat. At some point, we, we wanted our kids to speak some pretty freaking good French and putting them in schools in France seemed like the way to do that. So that was kind of the trigger. And then we we just sort of um let it be a little bit under planned um and you know got there and weren't so sure we'd done the right thing but uh like i said we we did have this sense of adventure for our for our most of our marriage and we were willing and knew we had the skills that we had to to make something happen whether it was the dream trip or whether it was something we just got through such a cool story. And you mentioned, you know, when people think tax preparer, they don't think necessarily adventurer. And my honestly, I wasn't, I think it was probably in my 20s before I like 
connected the dots that my summer vacations always uh, were aligned with the Minnesota Association of Public Accounting Convention and the National Association of Public Accounting Convention because my dad was a CPA. No kidding. So, yes. Yeah, so um, it is a bummer that, you know, people in the accounting, financial kind of services world get the you know, pocket protector, boring person <laughs> sort of thing. And I've been around a lot of them and some fit the bill. I will and say, some yes, don't. during my annual continuing education class, there, there is a lot of the stereotype there. I, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but then there are some that don't and you right. were outside of that. So when you, what there, you also talk about, and you just wrote a book and I want to make sure that I, I mentioned this, the book, a season for that lost and found in the other Southern France. Right. And when you were over there and you and your wife were like, what on earth did we do? And you've connected all this to middle age. Did you have a, what, you know, the middle life crisis or, or is that something that you can relate to? So many people talk about it. Um, it, it's a question of terminology. My wife will say yes. I will say I had a reassessment or something. But, <laughs> um, you know, I don't think it was the midlife thing that triggered this, that triggered our going, but our going triggered the re, a reassessment. Um, and that was that I was 45. Um, I was doing I, I I was we were comfortable in a very middle class way. Um, I was doing a job that I did not mind at all. Um, but there was this dream that really started in Paris when I was in my 20s. That experience was, yes, partly about Paris, but it was also very much about my moving from an American suburban childhood and adolescence to this world-class city where I could speak French well enough that I could immerse myself and kind of disappear into being a Parisian and being an intellectual and being a multilingual sort of sophisticated person that was very different from who I was back home at Burger King with the other members of the tennis team. Um, so there was certainly an idea about going back to France that had to do with reconnecting with that earlier version of myself that I considered sort of a, a superior version of myself that seemed to only happen when I was in France. Um, and so to the extent that there was a there was a midlife crisis or there was midlife musings involved in this, it definitely was that. There had been a lot of waiting through the busy middle years of parenting and career to do something a little bit bigger than just merely a, a, a stable and, and, and successful small business. And um, I think what I expected was awaiting me there. Um, was it ended up being very, very different from what I had in mind, certainly. And this is what I love about your story. Number one, you had a dream and you did the dream, but you didn't do the dream to where you couldn't return. So it wasn't like an all in sell everything. Let's just, you know, go crazy. It was like, well, let's see, let's test this. Let's do it long enough, but let's sort of test the dream. And then I also love how you talk about what you thought you were going to find and what you did find are different. And I think that's so important because had you gone there with a perfectly day by day, minute by minute agenda with expectations and goals that were so cemented that there was no room for the word you used, musings, you wouldn't have had the rich experience that you had. So shed some light on the do the dream, but not all the way do the dream, and also the space to have the experience. Those are two really great observations. Um, and both of them have interesting answers, I think. The do the dream, the, the, the sort of, oh my God, what did we get ourselves into moment did have to do with, even though we were prepared. So we went to the Languedoc region of Southern France, which is the um, sort of slightly poor cousin to Provence. So, you know, the Rhone River divides Southern France into two, very similarly to the way the Mississippi divides the, the Southern coast of the United States. And there's a Eastern half, which is Provence and, and the, uh, the, the, the Côte d'Azur, which is, you know, heavily touristed, quite expensive, a lot of rich people, a lot of beauty. And then there was the Languedoc. And we went there because of money. We couldn't afford to live in Provence, but we could afford to live in, in the Languedoc. So there was this um, 
I think we did go with some expectations. And I think part of what the place did that was a favor to us was insist on being what it was. And and we got to this dusty, dry, little 800-person village. Nobody knew us. Nobody was particularly interested that there were Americans among them. Um, and and we sort of had to get broken a little bit and and have what we wanted to impose on the experience uh, be swept away before we could actually have the the experience that we did have in the end, which was incredibly rich, incredibly immersive, um, it, it, generating lifelong friends that we have to this day, gener you know, creating a new relationship to food and wine um, and really to France. That all happened because at some point we stopped trying to impose ourselves on this place and on this experience and instead started letting the place and the experience tell us what it wanted to be. And then at that point, everything turned around. And at that point, it became the trip that it ended up being. But we did have to, at some point, uh, admit our ignorance and approach things from a stance of wonder. And, and really, once that happened, it was as if people were thrilled to talk about themselves and, and where they lived. But we needed to shed some illusions or shed some, some preconceptions. So I think that's an answer to part of your question. The other question is the going away for just long enough and coming back. And I'm still wrestling with that because it was in some ways I found a kind of ideal there. I really found a, it was a different version of myself from the Parisian version of myself. But it was still a version of myself I really loved. Um, and then we come back to the Twin Cities and I resume my tax preparation career and the kids go back to school. And I think what I did, what did happen there is that France, I thought France was going to be the end and the France was actually the trigger. And given the, you know, the, the title of this podcast and, 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 and the conversation that you tend to have with your guests, the flip the script ha really happened because I expected this to be about France. And in the end, it became about writing. <laughs> I had, I had wanted to be a writer again, since my twenties, since those old days of studying literature and, when we got there, I began I began journaling again. I turned in some articles to the Star Tribune. In the end, they won a few national food writing awards. And I was suddenly reconnected with this younger, earlier version of myself. And um, the, the coming back, if it had only been about France, I think the coming back would have been a disappointment. I am wrestling with this dual version of myself. There's the Minnesota version and there's the French version. I'm really in the process of trying to find out who I am in the context of the aftermath of this trip and of several trips that we took afterward to be there. But uh, the, what I did come back to was Steve as a writer, which was sort of old, but brand new and uh, has, has, ha has really become the thing that I think will be what I do in the third act of my life. Wow. That's so profound. I mean, to not just because there's also such like a humility and a vulnerability about saying, you know, I went and did this thing and I, I'm different uh, and I want to continue to iterate who I am. And that doesn't mean leaving my wife and children and being someone totally different, but figuring out how to blend kind of these two personas into you know, I have like a tale of two cities thing happening sort of. Yeah, thing, yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that that happened was I thought I wanted to be a particular persona. That was a kind of performance. It was, the per again, the person I was in Paris, this young, you know, I was tan and good looking back then, too, which was which helped. But <laughs> I was a tennis player. So I had that going for me back then. But more it was more I was this this sort of uh, this sophisticated world capital uh citizen and my french was good enough that that i that i surprised people in france with with my accent and with my with my ability to express myself and when we went back to france with the kids there was again this part of me that thought okay i'm going to go and i'm going to be this this person that i like better than my usual self over here and one of the other things yes i discovered writing but the other thing i really discovered through the experience of trying to cook there was 
that the other thing I really wanted was to be a good husband and be a good father. And there was a certain amount of shedding of ego involved in saying, okay, yeah, I can be this person. I can leave these people behind, or I can be a part of this sort of beautiful domestic intimacy that started to establish itself as I cooked from, from the beginning when I thought I wanted to cook like a fancy French chef to the end of the story when I discovered how, how rewarding it is to actually cook for your family. Um, and that there's a beautiful tradition that's just as French as French haute cuisine and restaurants um, that has to do with cooking really beautiful food, but cooking it for a small group of intimate people who you love and who love you and who want to eat your food. And so there was, yes, yes, writing was, was part of what came out of that, but also a renewed commitment to my place in the family and understanding that, that being a part of that involved sacrificing some other things. And, and that experience gave me the insight to see that, that whatever sacrifice there was, was so, so insignificant compared to the rewards of what I had with this family. Wow. Uh, so you didn't go there with the intention of writing. You went there and writing sort of found you and then you let it unfold like a memoir kind of would. Correct. And and here you are coming back a, a better version of yourself. But your family and your wife had to say, you know what, Steve, you can share this part of our vacation dream experience. Was it hard to get them on board with hey, we had this kind of intimate six-month life-changing experience, and now how about if I tell everyone about it? Um, in terms of on board, on board in terms of being characters in a story uh, yes. that, that gets published for hopefully and you millions saying, of people. <laughs> yeah, and you, and you saying things like, I'm not going to leave you all behind. I'm going to take you, I'm going to be a better version of myself, which implies that perhaps the version that they had in the past wasn't the best version of you. So there's some Correct. vulnerability in sharing that part of the story. Absolutely. I don't think they knew. I'm not sure I knew how, you know, maybe even slightly delusional my thoughts about the trip were before we got there. And it was very much Mary Jo intervening early on and saying, okay, this isn't going to work. You know, we're, this, this, this can't be three people in a foreign country um, as, as sort of spectators in the Steve Hoffman show. Uh, we have, we have to, you have to make this something more interesting or this thing you have with France is not going to work for our family there. You know, I speak half decent Spanish. There's no reason we couldn't go to Madrid and at least I would not insist on speaking perfectly. And I would get out in among people and, and talk and make a fool of myself if necessary. And we need more from you than, than we're getting right now. And that was the message early in the trip. And that was really the trigger. That was sort of the inciting incident to to me reassessing and saying okay well i'm now i'm now torn between <laughs> this family i love and this place that i love and i'm being told i need to be somebody new or i'm going to lose one or possibly both of them and a, a huge part of the story is me then trying to figure out how, how to get over myself to some extent how to be a little bit foolish how to how to how to stand in ignorance before somebody rather than showing them how much I know. Um, and also giving up a little bit of what I felt thought France was. I thought France was Paris. And here we are in this dry, dusty, smelly place that's 50 minutes from the Mediterranean. And um, it's not people dressed up in, you know, uh, flannel scarves and high heels on the streets of Paris. This is people in working boots and uh, workers overalls driving tractors through the street. And what does that mean for France? And what does that mean about what I've chosen to do here? And how do I become a part of this place? And do I really even want to be a part of this place? It's so different from what I had expected. And to have the realization that my expectations are fine, but turns out this isn't reality. And that happens in relationships. Like that happens pretty much every vacation, even if it's a short one where like you build it up and you build it up, but you build it up and then you get there and you're like, oh, right. 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 Yes. Yeah. Here I am. <laughs> the diapers really do still need to be changed in Florida. Yes. Yeah. Right. right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you know, we've talked about it and I did pour the wine and now I'm going to have a sip as you answer Please the do. next question. But you know, there is something magical about France and and now as I've been fortunate enough to to have gone 
and the Paris Olympics are happening, mm-hmm. and many, many people across the world will be having uh, an exposure to France. But to your point, it likely will be the tourist France. It will be the France that is the Eiffel Tower, and that it is people in the you know the beret and the baguette and the ballet shoes, the sort of version that we have that isn't the people who live there. It's the people right. who conjure this up. So as we're all kind of being transported with the athletes to to Paris. And as we have the wine and we think about the bread and the beautiful things that are, you know, two-dimensional Paris and France, what else do we need to know about France that we aren't going to get by drinking the wine and going to a French restaurant in wherever part of the world we live in? Um, Great question. Uh, First of all, about France specifically, I would say that the more you get to know France, the more you understand that it is not, even though even though two French people is very centralized and Paris is the hub. Um, the more you get to know France, the more you understand that it really is a, just a collection of regions. And those regions all have ties to Paris and Paris in some ways expresses some of what it imports from those regions. But really it is it is a collection of very specific places with surprisingly varied geography that and and each region is in some sense semi-autonomous it has its own identity uh it has its own food it has its own cheese it has its own often wine or other kind of beverage and so <clears throat> there is that that's one thing i would say about france is that paris is is its own experience but it is in no way visiting paris is in no way visiting france it is visiting paris um, the second thing I would say has to do with our experience there and what it taught us, not just about France, but really about travel in general. And that is that there's a travel industry and there is travel as a, as an occupation or as a hobby. And, and I think people think they're having deep experiences when they travel because they're seeing so much that's new and it feels as if they're expanding. But really, if you look at, at what travel mostly involves, it is there's an incredible sameness to it. It's a lot of airports. It's a lot of hotels. It's a lot of transportation. And it's a lot of experiences that have been either experienced by others and documented and which you are now re-experiencing Uh, or experiences that have been packaged because the only way to consume them in the small amount of time we have in the places we go is for them to be packaged for us. And part of what this experience did for us and taught us was there is an incredible richness and really a surprising diversity of experience in in picking one place and staying there, staying put for a while. Um, what, What we came back with was you know, a knowledge of this part, this very specific part of the world that was not as deep as anybody who lives there, but deeper than most other people who have been in that place. And it it was because we just stopped moving for a while and let the place speak to us. And I think that can be that can be extrapolated from our experience to almost anything. I I think um, there I think travel, quote unquote, is simply on a timeline that doesn't allow deep experiences all almost by definition and that to have the kind of experiences that you think you're going to get when you travel and that you in theory want when you travel involves sort of un decoupling yourself from travel as a as an activity and instead committing to places not not collecting world capitals but picking a few places that mean something to you and then committing to them almost like a long relationship. It's such a different way to think about travel, such a different way to think about experience and and the the role of place. And in every book, every story you read, the the character, one of them is the place. And mm-hmm. in your writing, the place and the experiences of the place are so critical becoming the main character of one of the main characters Absolutely. of the story. Absolutely. So when you think about your go forward from here as a changed, different kind of version of yourself, are you Steve the writer? 
Are you Steve the tax preparer? Are you Steve the father? Are you Steve the husband? Like, has this changed how you identify yourself or how you think about yourself? And kind of initially you said there's this guy, you know, from my 20s, and then there's this version. Like, have you blended that all together? Or are you still wrestling with what that means at different stages of your life? I'm definitely wrestling with it, but I also definitely have thought about this a lot. And it's, again, a really great question. And what I here's what I think my takeaway is, and that is that part of part of this experience was being in this place at 45 instead of at 23, which meant that there are there are now limitations <laughs> that weren't there when you're younger. And so rediscovering writing, which was an early love in a lifetime love, even though it got put in a back burner for a long time, recommitting to a, 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 a fulfilling an intimate family life. Part of th those are all yeses, but all those yeses involved no's to other things. And I think in every yes is always a no to everything else that you're not saying yes to. And I think a really important takeaway was that th there are any number of things I could have pursued as a result of this, including trying to make wine, including become becoming not just a competent home cook, but a really accomplished, um, you know, semi-professional cook or certainly more than amateur cook. Um, there was potentially buying a place in France, there was widening our social circle to include more people in France, in addition to our, our friends here, which we did a certain amount of. But ultimately, the, the big message that got taken away is that the what I feel like the, the one of the most important um, activities of the rest of my life is editing what means something really important to me and what I could do, and that would be really fun, and that might be rewarding, but that isn't central, that's not core to who I am, who I love, what my values are. And, and what I think I can do, not just in a fun and entertaining way, but what I can do in a way that starts getting close to mastery, so that I'm doing something as well as I can possibly do it. And, and to get to a point where you're doing something as well as you can possibly do it, you have to stop doing some other things. And, and so I would say that the, the person that you're talking about that emerged from this trip, the person I'm trying to become, and it really isn't in the process of figuring out who that is, but there, there are a core set of, of important things and it's family, it's, it's writing, which meant I have to, there's other things I, I, I I'm not going to be able to do. Uh, it is, a, it is a relationship with France, but what that is, I'm not sure. And then it's, it, to some extent, recommitting to being a Minnesotan. Because if I'm spending my whole life just wishing I were somewhere else, I'm not living the life that I'm living. And so I, there, there is definitely an element of, of, you know, part of what we did when we were in France is just simply pick this place, devote ourselves to it, get to know what we could about it, um, accept what it did best, and then kind of revel in that. And there's an extent to which I think a lot of my life where I was just wishing I could be in Paris was a form of wasting that part of my life. And um, I'm trying really hard to, and I love Minnesota. It's, it's, it, I, I love, um, I love its sanity. I love its, how, how beautiful its nature is. I love lakes and water. I love the, uh, the, the Twin Cities community. I, I really have a deep affection for Minnesota. And there's, there is a part of me too, that's, that's trying to figure out why we came back, why we're staying here, what it what it is that makes this place a part of me in a way similar to the way that I felt that Mediterranean France had become a part of me. You know, Steve, we missed the boat because we should have had the Minnesota Department of Commerce and the French <laughs> Tourism Department sponsor the episode, and they should have bought me this bottle of wine. Um, so, you know, the, what you, the way that you talk about all of this, it really is about honesty with yourself. It's understanding mm -hmm. who you are right now. It's mm -hmm. understanding how to make the most of where you are right now. It's trying to be in a constant place of self-discovery and evolution and, and siphoning out the difference between the non-negotiables, the, the people yep. who you're going to have in the life, and then 
the things that matter to you and making sure that everyone is aligned so that your evolution can happen alongside the non-negotiable people who are on the journey with you. And, and from our whole conversation, this, this concept of, you know, it's, it's never too late and you are never done. Like, it doesn't matter your age. Right. It doesn't matter your life stage, kids, little old kids, no kids, whatever you, you have an opportunity to sort of that, you know, bloom where you're planted sort of concept and you can have the dream, but if the dream is taking over your current space, my goodness, you're missing out there too. So there's, it's such a rich I want to make a bad like food reference or something like it's like a a sauce with the starts one way and finishes another way or something. But it's it's like a very rich sort of concept that I think, and I'm interested in your perspective on this. I think women talk about it better than men do. I, I don't know very many men that are talking about the evolution of themselves in middle age. And that seems like one of those topics that is gendered. And I love and applaud that you're talking about it in a very honest, natural, relevant way. That's very different from, I think, the way that your grandfather perhaps would have talked about being 45. Have you gotten pushback or anyone saying, hey, Steve, Seriously, let's like watch the Vikings and have a six pack. I don't want this varietal from France. What are you talking about? Uh, that's. I think that is true. I think that that uh, to the extent that that can be generalized at all, I think women do tend to talk about that better and maybe more often. Um, one of the things I love about the Twin Cities is that uh, it is it has a population of emotionally available men, and I happen to have made friend had, had made friends with a number of them. In the, in the chef community, where, which I'm very close to and, and intertwined with. Um, I have a best friend who is somebody I can talk to about this and who is in the same mindset. And so, um, and I think I really feel as if, you know, um, this is an interesting direction for this to go because it was very personal and familial at the time. Th this moving away from a sort of male male centric ego driven kind of cooking to a uh to, to trying to be a domestic cook for a family I, I i went through that evolution to some extent um and i feel as if um it was certainly far more rewarding what i discovered at the end than what i was trying to be at the beginning and i feel as if the as i said the these emotionally available men that i uh, have managed to bring into my life or be part of their lives are are unafraid to have the feminine mix with the masculine. And we play tennis together and we both, we all want to kill each other on the court. And then we get off the court and we can talk about our families and we can talk about the fact that we're all enter, entering the third uh, act of our lives. And uh, we can talk about loss and friendship and family. Um, I feel as if there is an embrace of what has traditionally been thought of as feminine that has been an incredibly rewarding aftermath of our experience in France and, and what's happened since. And I wasn't expecting the conversation to go here either, but I, I'm often during the, during talking with guests during the conversation reminded of how far we've come as a society, because I think, you know, we're in the middle of a political cycle where according to polls, most people aren't real thrilled with their options. And there's a lot of the, America's terrible and, you know, wh whatever, but my goodness, we've come so far in other ways. Right. And, and the, even a, a male saying, I have a best friend 30, 40, 50 years ago mm -hmm. would have been kind of unheard of. And the reason that we are where we are is because, men like you are are talking about it really openly and sharing the concept of emotionally available men. And women like me are saying, my husband cooks, I don't like to cook. And it's awesome because right, right. I'm not defined by a, a role that someone else thinks I should or shouldn't have when I don't really like it. Right. So I, I think we have this kind of freedom, uh, which which is so wonderful. And even the freedom to continue to explore who you are and, and where you want to be and who you want to be with at all stages of life. It's it's a shift and it's very healthy. Very much so. And I think um, the, the other uh, another aspect of this uh, of this trip, at, this trip was an expression of something that had been there for a long time, but that got made explicit. And that was that. <clears throat> 
um, I was in a marriage of equals, which again is a newish, right? In terms of um, that being something that's held up as rewarding and a, and a kind of ideal. And so when you're in a marriage of equals, you can really easily or much more easily ignore what the the roles were that that you thought you were meant for uh, because you get to just decide what works and if you're both on the same page and you're sharing the same narrative uh, for your life together then and this has happened with my with my spouse Mary Jo you know we she started off as an aerospace engineer and I was Mr. Mom for the first four years of our daughter's life. And then that wasn't working. She, you know, we were trying to have a second child. We thought the stress of the, of that um, career was possibly inhibiting that. So we tag teamed and I went and became a tax repairer and she stayed home with the kids. And that could have been seen as in some, you know, as a defeat for her, as a, you know, as a, a strong woman who had a career who was headed for, you know, probably vice president of Honeywell at some point. And that, that step back into just being a mom for a while uh, was entirely her choice with no second thoughts. Um, and yet it could have been seen as a step down. And instead it was just seen, it was just seen as one step in the, in the, you know, the sine wave up and down exchange of roles that was going to happen over an entire life. And so, yes, it was, there, there were times when it was unbalanced in one way, professionally and personally, and then for another era, it was unbalanced in another way. And the the the, the beauty of a long marriage and of and of understanding that you're gonna it's you're gonna be there for the whole thing is that you can endure eras where it's not entirely your time and know that your time will come. And I feel as if part of the thrill of what's happening now is that we are entering a phase where <clears throat> because parenting and and career is so demanding there's no way out of it once you've chosen that there are there are simply things that have to be done now suddenly we are looking forward to this next this next act as i like to call it it's not we don't really like even to call it retirement because it's not going to be a retirement it's going to be an extension of what we've been doing but now for maybe the first time there's this idea that we can actually uh choose our own rules again in a way that will be sort of both old and new but that but where the demands of daily life won't get in the way as much as they were for those middle years. And I never put it all together, but I just feel like um, this kind of concept of the no boundaries and no rules and what that, re that relates to place in life and place, actual physical place. And it is uh, my 28th wedding anniversary Saturday, and we're going to Maison Margot. So oh, I feel beautiful. very well, there like you go. I'm, there you go. Well, <laughs> all the all the things are connecting. And if you don't know what that is, Google it. It's it's well known in the Twin Cities, kind of newish French restaurant. And so, um, tip on what I should order. Uh, you know what? David Fema is a friend, and he's going to kill me, but I still have not been there. It's one of the very few. I know. I know. I know. Uh, it's one of the very few restaurants in that in the Twin Cities that I haven't been to. That's open in the last year or two, and I. I, I have been writing and promoting a book as well as being a tax preparer. So that's my excuse. Uh, but it's, it's a good it's, excuse. It's very high on the list. And I will be dying to hear what you do get because uh, he's he's a wonderful chef. I'll put it on social media. Okay, and uh, this episode will come out after that. There but I um, <laughs> cheers. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I want to mention the name of the book one more time before I ask you the final question. Yes. So the book, Steve's book, A Season for That, Lost and Found in the Other Southern France. And I'm excited to read more of your writings and musings about France and food and also relationships and place and time. And yeah, what a great conversation. It was a joy I, I, to I talk love, with you. Yeah, I love that we, that we wandered in such productive and uh, moving ways. It was beautiful. We had our own muse. That's right. Right. <laughs> Perhaps that what French wine will do to will go. do to the host. And um, I'm perfectly no, I, sober and it still works. So <laughs> I literally took two sips the whole episode. If you're not like physically watching. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, anyway, so final question quote that you would share with us as you have flipped your script. And based on what you've shared today, I suspect you will do it again. <laughs> um, and, and interestingly, the quote that I came up with before this conversation is from my wife, Mary Jo who at some point said, 
uh, Stevie, you can do anything you want, but you cannot do everything you want. And that that requirement to realize that there was some editing involved in order to live the life I wanted to was very much a part of the turning point toward being in this place right now. Thank you, Steve. It was a it was a pleasure. A huge pleasure. Thank you. Well, as we wrap up the episode, I think the the flip your script challenge is really to fill in to fill in this sentence. If I was 20 again, I would blank. Because somewhere buried in that answer is probably a seed of something that you still have time to do. And let me tell you, if you're 20 and listening, then go back 10 years, go back five years, go back two years. But if time and place and money and people weren't boundaries and you considered them all part of the story, what would you do? Where would you go? How would you think? And also remember, you're never too old. Continue to evolve. It's a lot of work but it's rich and it's worth it. My hope is Steve's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. 